The goal of the parables is the parables are written to the believers, to Christians, <clears throat> because they have to have some kind of spiritual understanding to understand the parables. The earthly part of the story, anybody can understand, but the spiritual application has to be spiritually understood. <clears throat> when, we're, when we're looking at parables, we're looking for main ideas. <clears throat> Basically, a parable is an earthly story that's very relatable. We, we can understand the earthly part of it. It, it makes sense in God's world. And uh, the purpose of it is to give us this story that we can carry around with us. It's a, it's a way of learning doctrine, a way of learning truth, and an easy way to, uh, to carry around with us a particular truth. And these, <clears throat> these are called the kingdom parables because it's about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And uh, this helps us to understand the spiritual nature of the kingdom of God, which is an emphasis of Matthew. And when he talks about the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> so these are stories that uh, God gives to us to be able to carry truths around with us uh, that, that stick with us in a very uh, simple way, in a powerful way, because it's a story. Verse 31, <clears throat> we'll look at a few of the, the uh, shorter parables. Verse 31, another parable he put forth to them and he said, the kingdom of heaven is like... It's like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and he sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it's grown, it, it becomes the greatest among the herbs and it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Thank you, Father, again for your word, the parables as we look at them, uh, for the lessons that you give to us, for your goodness to your children, how you love your children and reveal your truth to your children. Uh, we are thankful for the revelation of truth, that we don't have to sit in darkness like the rest of the world, nor walk about in darkness, not understanding God's purposes for this world. Uh, we're thankful for thy, thy kingdom, your rule over the whole world, and the special rule that you have in your church, among your people, and uh, the, the great promises and purposes and hope that you've set before us as to a future uh, life here upon the earth in the new heavens and the new earth. We pray that your kingdom would come, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask that you would uh, bless us this day, O oh Lord. Take away our sins, any sins that we have committed against you, that you might cleanse us and make us pure so that we are fit vessels for thy service and also so that we are uh, prepared and able to receive the word <clears throat> from you this morning. Our desire is uh, to be pure in our hearts and not hypocritical, but that we come with uh, a right desire uh, to hear from you so that you will indeed speak to us. So we pray that you would speak to us through these parables and cause these truths to be placed upon our hearts, that we would take it with us. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Verse 31. The parable he puts forth this time, in which he compares uh, God's kingdom, Christ's kingdom, to is the grain of mustard seed. It's like to a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field, which is the least of all seeds, but when it's grown, it's the greatest among the herbs and becomes a tree, so that birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So in this parable, um, the story itself, uh, maybe some of you have seen the mustard seed um, they used to put them in little glass bottle-like things that people would hang around their, their neck, little necklaces, and it was a teeny tiny little seed. So you know among the seeds that there's all kinds of sizes of seeds. So the obvious, obviously he's making a comparison here between what appears to be this teeny tiny seed, which seems to be the least of the seeds. In other words, it seems insignificant. 
because when you hold it, it, it's so small. But the fruit that bears out of it is significant. In fact, he says among the herbs, the, the greatest of the herbs, are the idea of a plant that grows up where it's not just a flimsy little plant, but it's one in which uh, the birds of the air could actually lodge in as well. So the basic idea that we get from this parable is the contrast between that which is seemingly insignificant versus that which is actually quite significant. Um, <clears throat> and so he says the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. So we would say that the kingdom of heaven is to the natural eye, it is seemingly insignificant. It is seemingly insignificant. Um, to this world, the kingdom of heaven is seemingly insignificant. They look at the kingdom of heaven, they look at the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, they look at religion of Christ, they look at the teachings of Christ, and when they look at that to the world, it seems absolutely insignificant. It doesn't seem that wise, it doesn't seem smart, it seems foolishness to, to many of them. Their philosophers come up with what they believe are much wiser ideas about life in the world. And uh, their seeds that they have, that they sow into the earth, seem to be far more significant than this idea of a, of a Christ and a, a bloody cross and this man who comes who says he's God and man and all these things that they count to be foolish and insignificant. <clears throat> when you look at the church as it is planted in all the world, it's always a, a remnant that's in the world. It's a small portion that's in the world. So compared to the other groups or kinds of people that are in the United States, the church is a small group. It is seemingly insignificant. Uh, when, the, when you go to political, the political process, for the most part, the uh, Christianity, when it is talked about, if it is talked about in the chambers of the Senate or the House of Representatives, it is often scorned. And recently, of course, the famous statement that the Bible and Christianity has no place whatsoever in the chambers of our political process was the statement that was made. And though everybody won't make that statement, there's a lot of people that believe that statement, even though they won't even say it. So the kingdom of heaven <clears throat> seems insignificant to the carnal eye. It takes a spiritual eye, a believer's eye, to be able to see and understand the significance of it. So it's seemingly insignificant. It's not carnal power, which is what the world is impressed by. It is spiritual power. It's not the man who will turn the other cheek when he's slapped on the face. It's the man who can take his fist and break the jaw of the person who just slapped him on the face. That's what's significant to the world. While Christianity in all of its manifestations seems very backward, weak, insignificant in the way its methodology to Islam, which converts people by the tip of the sword, Christianity seems very weak and looks very weak to them because they do what they do by force, by power, by carnal power. So it's, Christianity is like a grain of mustard seed. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And while you're turning there, we'll think about also Elijah on the mountain and on the mountain the the Lord sends a wind and he breaks the rocks in pieces and an earthquake and he sends all these things and then a still small voice. Something that seems insignificant but actually is more powerful than all of those things. So we pay attention to, and we'll look at that in David's psalm today actually as well, there's comparisons made. But earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes and all those things are powerful things and course to the believer that also relates to God but to the world those are powerful things but the still small voice of the gospel as it is presented to them is just insignificant and yet it's not insignificant it's actually the power of God 
divine power. 2 Corinthians 10.3, for though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. <clears throat> we're, in, we're, in our, we're in human bodies. We are in the flesh in that sense, but we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not earthly, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So it's prayer, it's prayer, you know, and, and people mock, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to pray about it? And they'll say things like that. Well, we're going to do something about it. You go ahead and you pray if you want. Because Christianity always seems insignificant. The spiritual kingdom seems insignificant to them. But he says, our warfare is not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We use the word of truth. We use the Bible. They mock the Bible. We use the Bible. The Bible is the power of God. They make fun of the Bible. We use the Bible. They say, well, it's just a book. It's the power of God. And so when we raise arguments out of the word of God, which they can't answer because it is the word of God and because there is power in it and because there is truth and there's divine logic in it, you know, once they get tired, if they get tired enough of hearing the logic of it, they bring out the guns and they just say, shut up. This is what you're going to believe. That's what they say in communist countries. They say, we don't want to hear about it anymore. This is what you will believe. So it seems insignificant. They say it's insignificant, but actually it's very powerful. And the kingdom of God is like that. Paul said to the Corinthians, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to those who are saved, it's the power of God. So they see it as insignificant. We understand it to be the very power of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And when I, when I, when I see this parable <clears throat> about the mustard seed, so the mustard seed, this little teeny tiny seed, and you put it in the ground, it seems insignificant, but then it ends up being growing to this large bush which birds can rest in. It actually becomes useful. It's useful because Christianity is like that. Christianity, which seems so insignificant, is actually the most useful thing in the whole world. And I always think of Francis Schaeffer the, when he talked about all the philosophies of the world. He was a Christian philosopher. If you don't know him or know of him or have read after him, we now have a new slew of books downstairs from Mr. Schaefer that you need to get to know some of his teaching. But one of the things he would teach was that of all the philosophies of the world, none of the philosophies except Christianity has the power, the ability, the strength to undergird society that the pressures of life and the pressures of evil, the pressures of a fallen world cannot be sustained by other philosophies or by other religions. They don't have the ability to keep a society together and hold it in such a way in which it is profitable and in which it actually produces what Christianity produces, which is a microcosm which we have in our church is a microcosm of society in which all kinds of people can come together of every country and of every economic background and they can all work together and love each other and you have a useful working society within the church while outside of the church you have every kind of problem and trouble and killing and hatred and bigotry and all all the rest of it because those philosophies do not and cannot produce something that is strong enough to undergird a society and the, the, the nature of man in his fallen state. Only Christianity can do that. So when I think about this parable, I think about what Schaefer said, Christianity is that seed that grows into this wonderful, strong plant that can bear up and be useful <coughs> for the creatures that can land in it and be a part of it. So the kingdom of God is the greatest of all philosophies, it seems insignificant, but it's the only philosophy that will bear up in a fallen world. So, I was discussing this with someone the other day, when I have atheistic thoughts come through my mind, and God, 
Uh, God allows for that at times. Even in the Christian may be assaulted by Satan, assaulted by atheistic thoughts in which he wonders, is there even any God? I think, okay, if there isn't the God that I worship, what else is my option out there? What other philosophies are the options that I have to believe in, that I'm going to rest my life upon and depend upon? And when I think about that, if you've studied any of them at all, you think, there's no way I'm gonna put my life on the line with those philosophies. They're, they're, they're worthless, they're foolish, they're evil oftentimes. So that's our parable, the parable of the mustard seed. You know, what do we carry around in our heart? We carry around in our heart, yes, the world thinks that Christianity is foolish and stupid and insignificant, and they mock it and laugh at it, and other people may laugh at it, some of your relatives may laugh at it. But at the end of the day, it is the only philosophy that can sustain this world and sustain a useful society. Matthew 13 and verse 33. He said, another parable, he spoke unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, um, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. All these things Jesus spoke to them in parables, and without a parable, he did not speak unto them. So here's an even shorter one. So, um, so what is it called now? It's not called leaven. What do we put in it? Yeast, right? Yeast. I gotta think through these things. I gotta talk to the fellows from Haiti, and then I gotta find out what word they use for this thing as well. Going from the scriptures to the Greek to the English to the Haitian. So in this parable, a very, very simple parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. It's like leaven. Now, leaven is used in the scripture in a, in a couple of different places. Is leaven a symbol of that which is good or is it a symbol of that which is evil? That's a good answer. Evil. <laughs> That's a good answer. Um, so, so the answer to that question, which is just a teaching question, is that sometimes in the Bible, the leaven is a picture of what is good. Sometimes in the Bible, it's a picture of what is evil. Historically, and it's interesting that he uses this, because historically with the Jews, with um, the Passover and their, their feasts, they would get rid of the leaven. They would get it out of the house. And it was not allowed in the house. And then in 1 Corinthians 5, turn there. First Corinthians 5 is the teaching on church discipline, a case of sexual immorality within the church of Corinth in which Paul says they should have judged already. It was an obvious case. It was a scandalous case. Everybody in the community knew they were committing this sexual sin. And so he, he berates the, the Corinthians for not taking care of it and tells them in verse five to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we take to be the process of excommunication by which we remove a member and basically give that member for the moment back to the world and say, if you're gonna behave this way, you cannot be a member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are going to take your membership from you and now you can go back to being with the world and let Satan beat you around if that's who you wanna serve. And then, he says in verse six, your glorying is not good. 
Know ye not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even now Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So in this, in this passage, that picture given to us is get rid of the leaven, because that's the evil among you. And if you allow the evil to, say, to stay, what's going to happen? It's going to infiltrate the lump. So churches that do no church discipline and that allow for scandalous sin to be in their churches and just don't say anything about it, and just leave it alone, things don't get better because we're in a wicked world. Things get worse because it is a message from the eldership, a message from the leadership that evil is okay and that we're not going to do anything about it. And so it'll end up leavening the lump. And the church ends up, if it stays that way, they never do church discipline, you'll eventually have what the scripture calls a synagogue of Satan, in which you have mostly unbelievers in that church until finally all the believers depart from the place. So in this picture, they use the leaven or the yeast as a picture of evil influence and how the evil influence and he says you need to be unleavened and of course he's saying unleavened here because it's a picture of the Passover in the Passover you got rid of the yeast got rid of the leaven and you had unleavened bread and that and you were just only to have that so you had to get rid of it altogether now the reason I say that is not because we're studying church discipline but because in our parable it's a parable about leaven so there are there are some who once they see the picture used in a certain way in the scripture, and that leaven was pictured as something evil, they think that every time it's spoken of elsewhere, it has to mean evil too. And I think that's one of the things we have to mature into in our own interpretation of the scripture is to realize that symbols, symbols sometimes may mean the same thing all the way through the scriptures. But symbols don't always remain the same picture because it's a symbol and it's a symbol of something. Um, and it may apply to something evil and apply to something good. And what's, what's gonna determine that? How are you gonna know whether or not it's, it, it's meaning something good here or meaning something evil there? What's the determining factor on that for your interpretation? It's your context, right? Context is king. Most important, one of the most important tools of Bible interpretation is context. What is the context telling you? What is the context teaching you? So we come back to our parable in Matthew chapter 13, this particular parable. Verse 33, a very small one. Another parable, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. So we can't say the kingdom of heaven is like unto something evil that pervades. So... When we, when we talk about parables, I've been saying you need to find the, the main principle, the main teaching. So what is the main teaching? What is the main teaching about leaven? The main teaching about leaven is not good and it's not evil. That's not the main teaching about leaven. What is the main teaching about leaven? Pervading. It pervades. Because the symbol is tied to the earthly thing, which is yeast, and what yeast does is it, when you put it in the lump and you begin to mix it in, it pervades the whole lump. So whether it's pervading it in an evil way or whether it's pervading it in a good way will depend upon the context of the scripture. But the main thing remains the same, which is this pervasiveness, pervasiveness. So he says, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and she hid in three measures of meal, as it were, you put it in there and you begin to mix it, till the whole was leavened. Till the whole was leavened. So what does this teach us? What's the story that we carry around in our hearts about it? That the kingdom of heaven, um, the first parable, it appeared insignificant, but it was actually very significant. And the kingdom of heaven here, actually, it appears as though it is just something that is hidden away because it's in the soul. It's in the heart. It happens in the heart. It happens in the soul. It's like the wind 
that comes and you can't see, but you see the effects of it. And it's the leaven too, you, it's hidden in the dough and then it's mixed in and it begins to pervade the whole dough and you don't even know quite how it happened, but it happens because it's the nature of it. We know it has to happen. And that's how the kingdom of heaven is when, when God plants his seed of the new nature in a man. At first, he may have a lot of rough edges, but it's going to pervade his whole nature. He's going to come to the word of God and he's going to begin to align himself with what the word of God teaches in all ways. So it pervades his thinking and it pervades his education and it pervades his work ethic and it pervades his political ideas and it pervades his ideas of church and it pervades his relationships. It pervades everything. So that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. When the new nature is planted, there is the beginning, we would say, the beginning of a great transformation. So in that transformation works throughout the whole being. There's nothing, there's nothing in the Christian's life in which he says to God, that's my part and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do what you want in this little part. I'll just do it in 99% of the parts. No, we do whatever God wants in 100% of the parts. As John L. Dagg said in his Systematic Theology, if there's any single part in which you are withholding from God, that is the very part in which you need to test your soul as to whether or not you are rebellious or not toward your master. So the kingdom of heaven is like, uh, like leaven, like yeast. It pervades, it pervades every part of the soul, which, you know, wipes away the, the carnal Christian theory, the idea that someone could be a Christian but have all, these, all this carnality working regularly in him. No, we have the work of God working regularly within us. All right, perhaps one more. Uh, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44. Matthew 13 and verse 44. We have two parables, one right after another, that seem very similar. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hidden in a field which a man finds. He hides for the joy thereof and he sells all that he has to buy that field. So the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure, which is found, and once it's found, he sells everything to have it. The next parable is the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he has found the one pearl of great price, he goes and he sells everything that he has and he bought it. And people say, well, these things teach, they just teach the same thing. Well, there is similarities to it. The end is the same. Right? The end is the same. The end is that you're gonna sell everything you have to have this. You're gonna sell everything you have to have the kingdom of God. There's nothing, there's no obstacle that will ever keep you. If you belong to the Lord, if God's begun this work, if he's regenerated your soul, there's nothing that's going to keep you from having Christ, from having the kingdom. Uh, as is pictured elsewhere, with violence he enters in with a sword fighting his way in. So those, that is similar in these two, but the approach is different because one of them is a treasure hidden in the field, which suddenly he finds. The other one is a, is a merchant man seeking goodly pearls and then finds the one pearl. So there, there, are, there is a nuance that's different in the two. So the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. We, we would say certainly we know that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. It is a treasure. Paul says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have lost all things and do count them but dung to have them. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ, written by a man who probably knew dozens of languages, Paul. He was a brilliant scholar, 
a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he said, I have found, I have discovered, it found itself to me, this knowledge, this excellency of knowledge, this treasure, which is above all treasures. So the knowledge of God is, it is a treasure. It is a treasure. It is a treasure because it is the very salvation of the soul. The very salvation of the soul. Isaiah says, they that make a graven image are, all of them, vanity. And their delectable things will not profit. They are their own witnesses. They don't see, they don't know, that they may be ashamed. The other philosophies and religions are not a treasure. <laughs> they are vanity. They are vanity. Isaiah says again, Isaiah 47, 12, Stand now with your enchantments and with the multitude of your sorceries, wherein you have labored from your youth, if so be, thou shalt be able to profit. If so be, you may prevail. Show what you got, he says. He challenges. He challenges the other philosophies. He challenges the sorcerers. Give us what you got. Show us what you got. And this is what the Christian missionary has done in country after country after country as the missionary movement, especially expanded in the 1800s and it went out into countries in which witchcraft and sorcery was the dominant religion in those places. Uh, like the queen, the last queen of Hawaii who was converted and then she went to the god of fire which they worshiped. She went down into the volcano and into, into the crater of one that was active and she defied the god of the, of, of the uh, volcano to kill her, to destroy her. And they couldn't believe what she was doing. And then she took sacred things of theirs and threw them in to be burned up. So she openly challenged these who believed these lies. We've been reading at home Paul White, the missionary to Africa who challenged constantly the witchcraft of the area. He was a doctor, he was a medical doctor. Gave the gospel to everybody he saw, but he was constantly challenging the witch doctors who hurt people. And these, these aren't, <clears throat> when we talk about witch doctors and we talk about sorcerers, these are not people who are just clowns, okay? These are people who financially broke the people and physically hurt the people, who would pour acid into people's eyes and would make them blind forever, saying it was a potion. And then if it didn't work, it was because the gods had been against them or because that person didn't have enough faith or whatever. And, and Paul White was constantly challenging these people for the ignorance that was in them. The kingdom of heaven is a treasure. It's a treasure. What we have in this country, even in the midst of all of our stupidity and rebellion right now, is a treasure that most countries don't have. And it's still the remnants of godly men and women who brought Christianity to this shore. The kingdom of heaven is it's like a treasure. It's like a treasure hidden, <clears throat> and it's hidden, hidden in the field, he says. We know that Adam and Eve, once they fell, once they fell away from God, once they rebelled against God, they hid. They hid from God. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden because men hide from God. Because they will not, they will not, they shut their eyes, even to that which they know of a certainty, that there is a God. They actively suppress the knowledge of God. And then Christ while he was here in the Gospels, openly spoke of the fact of the Gospel being hidden from the eyes of those who were proud and arrogant. Matthew eleven twenty five. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and have revealed them 
to babes. Even so, Father, it seemed good in thy sight. Which is the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. And it's also the doctrine and warning that we give to all men everywhere. In your pride and in your arrogance, you are rejecting and refusing the only God who can help you. The only God who has the truth. You have hid these things from the wise and prudent. That is, wise in their own eyes. Prudent in their own understanding. The rejection of the Holy Scriptures. And you have revealed them to babes. That is, those who are like babes and like little children. Those who say, teach me. Teach me. And have an humble teaching spirit. The kingdom is like a treasure hidden. It is hidden away from the eyes of those who are proud. And who think that they are wise in their own eyes. Wiser than the scripture. Wiser than divine revelation. Wiser than that which God has given to us. Paul says if our gospel is hidden. It is hidden to those who are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which don't believe, don't believe the gospel, don't believe the Holy Scriptures, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine to them. So in our parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure, but it's a treasure hidden. It's a treasure hidden. God's kingdom has great value great value that men will give up everything to have this kingdom when when God works in their hearts they will give up everything to have this kingdom they give up relationships Peter said we have left all and we have followed you and Jesus answered and said there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels but will receive a hundredfold now in this time houses brethren sisters mothers children lands with persecutions also and in the world to come eternal life. There are men who give up everything for the kingdom of God, everything. And are they the losers for it? Christ says they are not the losers for it. Christ says even to the Enochs in Isaiah, to the Enochs, Enochs who were castrated in order to be, uh, usually they were castrated to be head over uh, harems of, of kings. And he says to the Enoch, to the eunuchs, I'm sorry, the eunuchs who came into the kingdom and said, you know, you think that you are poor because you can't have sons. He said, but you're rich. You're rich if you have me. You have me. I'm better than sons. And for those who have left all in order to take the gospel elsewhere, some left all. Some had the gift of singleness. And they, they gave, gave up the whole idea of family or anything else to go to another place and preach the, the gospel of Christ. And God blessed them. And God gave them. Lands and fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers, all the converts, all their converts were their people that he gave them. You remember the, the rich man who came to Christ and he said to this rich man who believed he was okay with God, he said, you're lacking one thing, sell everything that you have, distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and follow me. But when he heard that, he was sorrowful because he was a really rich guy. And, and I've heard this preached. I've heard this preached by many modern preachers, too. It's an interesting preach, usually. <laughs> you know what they always say? They always say this. Well, I know he told him he had to give up everything. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that God means for you that you're going to have to give up everything. Oh, no. Contraire. Actually, the requirement's still the same, isn't it? If there is something that keeps you from Christ, it must be given up. It all must be given up. Because Christ doesn't pay second fiddle to anything. So if you have found this treasure hidden in the field and suddenly by the grace of God he has opened your eyes to this great treasure, you won't care about the other things. You'll sell everything you have 
to have this. They give up relationships. They give up friendships, you know. Oh, what will my friends think? What does it matter what your friends think? Do you have Christ? Do you have Christ? What, what, what will my mom think? What will my dad think? What does it matter what your mom or dad thinks? Do you have Christ? He is the great treasure. And they find God to be their everything. Proverbs, Psalm 27.10, when my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. You're going to lose your father and mother, God will take you up. You're going to lose a brother, you're going to lose a sister, you're going to lose a friend, you're going to lose some buddies at your, where you work, God will be your new friend. Some lose power, some lose prestige. But the requirement for discipleship never changes in Luke chapter 14 and verse 25, and this a powerful passage, it talks about discipleship. He says this, and there came great multitudes with him. He turned and he said to the great multitudes, if any man comes to me and he hates not his father, mother, wife, and children, brethren, sisters, his own life, he can't be my disciple. Whoever doesn't bear his cross and come after me, identify himself with me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower doesn't sit down first, count the cost, whether you have sufficient funds to finish it. Lest after you lay the foundation and you're not able to finish it, they will mock you and say, this man began to build, but he couldn't finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sits not down first and consults whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000? While the others are great well off, doesn't send an ambassadorage and have conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever be of you that forsakes not all that he has cannot be my disciple. So that Christ, in talking to the, the multitudes, the multitudes followed him for various reasons. He always had crowds and, and he was pressed upon and he was, his labors were tremendous because of the crowds that were with him. But he turns around to the crowds at this point and gives to them the terms of discipleship. And the terms of discipleship are you give up everything to follow me. Nothing. You cannot, you cannot put anything in front of me. And you, that you need to think about this. That the gospel isn't something that you just slip past people and get them to make a decision or manipulate them to pray the prayer. <laughs> no, the gospel is something that you tell them, you need to think about this. You need to think about the greatness of this commitment and the greatness of the God to whom you are going to be committing to. Because we don't pretend with people and we don't give them something just to get a certain reaction out of them or a word out of their mouth. Because this isn't a game. This is real. And this is heaven and hell. And this is whether or not you're going to spend eternity with this God who is the great treasure, who has sent his son who is the great treasure, has given us the gospel, which is the great treasure, who has a kingdom, which is the great treasure. And so he says, you think about it. Think about it. <clears throat> Otherwise, they will mock you like, like uh, old Pliable. Remember Pliable in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, where he said he was going to go and take the journey, but then in the middle of it, he wouldn't do it because of problems, and he went back, and what happened to him? They mocked him because he started something he couldn't finish. I've seen such foundations. In fact, there's one house that's actually sitting on a foundation, and it's just the shell of a house. And whenever we go over to Georgia, we, see, we oftentimes go past this thing, and it's been there for like 30 years in that condition. And that's just sad, isn't it? I saw it at Liberty, too. They had a place that eventually became their garbage dump, but they had started some foundations of buildings, and it was just there, a foundation that never had been finished. There's something sad about that. So this parable teaches us that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure. It's treasure, and it's a treasure hidden that has to be revealed to us. Once it is revealed to us, then there's nothing that we could think of that could be more valuable than having this treasure. And we will sell everything to have this treasure. And it's something that will last for the rest of our lives. We'll never at any point in our life say, oh, well, I guess I made a mistake. No, 
Not if the Spirit of God is, is indwelling us and we see Christ as our great treasure. Thank you, Father, for your, your mercy and grace. We thank you for Christ, for our great treasure. We thank you that you have revealed him to us. He was hidden away from our eyes because of our own sin and rebellion and arrogance and pride. And you have made known to us the beauty of Christ, the greatness of Christ, the glory of Christ, the majesty of Christ, the beautiful redemption and salvation that there is in Jesus Christ. And we are thankful, O Lord, for any revelation of truth that you give to us, anything that you teach us. Uh, it is something of beauty because it is yours and because it is divine logic. And so we ask, O God, that you would uh, strengthen us and help us ever and always to carry these parables in our hearts that we have indeed found our great treasure. And we pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.